Nice to be here. I, I've been connected uh, by coaching and by phone and by email a lot, and then being here a couple times each year for about nine years now. And you've been nice, and uh, I love working, especially with Craig and getting a chance to come here some. All I know is church, I can't fix a thing in, with my hands. Um, pastored for 43 years, just so you know, and for the last 12 now have been coaching churches. Uh, this, is, this is my favorite one, and uh, I, 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 I tell that to each church, but, but here I really mean it. I'm going to talk about stuff I grew up with. Um, and stuff I see in churches and the correction for it. It's in James chapter 1. If you'd like to join there or trust me as I read it, but I, I urge you to check this in your Bible. If, if people really understood what it is that God offers through his son, Jesus Christ, and the way of life, they would, you would think, you would think that they would all turn to Christ, or most of them. If people really understood what the Bible is about and not just jokes they heard or boring things they read in the book of Leviticus, if they really understood what God has done for this world, that he created it from, from zero by the word of his power, whoa, and that he keeps it, that he went after people and chose a certain group, the Jews, and chased them all through the Old Testament. They kept running away. If people really understood that after anger and 400 years of silence, that God sends his eternal son, by whom he made the worlds, to live among us as a baby and a young boy and a man and die with all of our sins on his back, rise again to defeat the greatest enemy that anybody here ever faces, death. If people really understood this, you would think they would all say, count me in. I want to go to church. I want to hear about it. One of the reasons they don't is this passage that people look in the Bible or say they believe it and live a totally awkward way and often a very selfish way. So James, uh, the clear writer and uh, who had been with Jesus, writes and tries to correct Christians especially. James chapter 1. Uh, listen to the word of God. Verse 19, my dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish uh, God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves, listen, of all moral filth and uh, uh, the evil that is so prevalent in Traverse City and in Sawyer, where I live, down the state. Humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Now he talks about the mirror. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, just hears it just like in a sermon or like when you read it, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror, for he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. Hello. Be doers of the word. What we know, and he starts off with three little phrases, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Now, we already know that, and he's, he's saying, trying to get us to think about the word of God. Well, first of all, we know this. You ought to be quick to listen. When I was little, my grandmother would tell us, it seemed a little corny, but you have two ears and one mouth. You should listen twice as much as you speak. Probably more than that we should. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Is that you? Human anger doesn't do much good lots of times. Sometimes it's good, but... He's going to talk about the mirror 
and how we hear the word of God. So at the beginning here, he says, humbly obey God's word. Don't be a big deal. I'm sure you know this. Uh, the three main works of God, and there are 20 or 50 or 1,000, but the three main works are creation, <clears throat> which he did by the word of his mouth. Amen. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Any questions? That's how the Bible describes it. But by the word of his mouth, he split the Red Sea, and they crossed. He didn't get a committee. He didn't have angels come down and split the water. He just said, split. Jesus, when he's on the Sea of Galilee and there was a storm and his disciples were scared, he, he said, peace still, stop it. <laughs> Two words, actually, in the Aramaic, and, and the storm stopped because he said it, it is so. <laughs> if he says you're forgiven, you're forgiven. You don't have to feel it. By the word of his power, he made the heavens and the earth, his second great work, he speaks to people through his word, especially. From the beginning, he has given truth. Blessed is a man who plants his life next to the word of God. And the third great work of God, of course, he could create, he could tell us truth, and he could save us and bring us to heaven with him forever. I don't know where you are on God, but that is not the God of the street that is not the God many people were brought up with. Okay, this is about obeying God's word. James is writing on this side of the river to show what a Christian should look like. Paul writes in Romans on this side of the river of judgment to say how you get across. You guys, here's how you get across. The cross of Jesus Christ. But once you're there, you ought to be quick to listen to the word of God and be careful, as, I know what that means, or slow to speak, and even slow in a conversation, and slow to anger. I want us to see, especially, he wants us to look at the word of God. Slow to speak and slow to anger. Verse 20, for human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, verse 21, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Huh? The word of God can save your souls. Yep. Humbly receive the word of God, but first rid yourselves of every moral filth. That's what we do. The Bible often puts it in terms of putting on clothing. Get off the dirty clothes, put on new clothes. Ephesians 4.1, put off in other words, we have a real part in our growth. If you're nice, you could say it's because of God, but I would also add, yeah, it's because of what you've decided. You put off selfishness and put off uh, crude language and dirty thoughts and dirty words and mean stuff, and you put on love, which holds us together. So James is saying, Christians, now he's writing to believers, you, you know you shouldn't get mad so fast. You know you should put off these things and put on the word of God and obey it. It was Abraham Lincoln, uh, president one time, who said, every man over 40 is responsible for his own face. I think it's over 18. And it, he just meant the kind of person you are, it's your choice. I have met people who say, well, I've just always been a grouch. I, I really know one. One of them goes here. I, I won't say which one, but he's over there. <laughs> Everybody's responsible to put off and put on. And he's gonna tell us how to do that right here. Uh, I've been in church work. It doesn't make me anything or good at it or anything for 55 years. I think this is the hardest time ever for the church. I really do. COVID and all the tough decisions leaders have had to make and, and all of us affected somewhat. Uh, Congress, and I mean by that all the politicians and how they argue, it's just terrible. Uh, can't you sit down and talk reasonable? 
and, and, and the third thing is communication. Uh, people say things on Facebook, I think they believe God can't read. They say things, I'm, I'm helping a church right now that wants to do church discipline about somebody because of their Facebook, Facebook posts. Oh, I get that, but come on. And a fourth C is Christians that often are very weak. It's so easy to say, yeah, I'm a Christian, and then live like the other side. It's a tough, a tough time, but... I'm here to talk to you personally and first to me. I could talk to myself on this all week. Put off and put on and do what's right. And then he says, the word of God, the last part of verse 21, is able to save your souls. What does that mean? It means by interpretation, the word of God is able to save your souls. It's just what it says. Because the word of God explains to us what eternal salvation is and what God wants from people, how they should respond to him. I, I took a survey once at the chapel back in Akron. Uh, I got to watch LeBron James grow up. Taught him everything he knows about basketball. <laughs> no, that's not true. We took a survey and I asked people on 10 questions, uh, a very large church, and we got a good response, meaning a lot of people. How do you know you're a Christian? Some of the answers were so weak. I've always been a Christian all my life. Nobody's been a Christian all his life. I was born into a Christian family. Good, that helps to know your parents are Christians. But what does it mean to be in Christ? The devils believe and tremble. James said that. In other words, a true and false test. The devil would say, a demon, there's a lot of them. Uh, do you believe in Jesus as the Son of God? Yep, I know that's true. That he died for the people of the world. Yeah, I, I was there when he died. That he rose again the third day. Yeah, a demon would go along with tr true and false tests. Yep. Of course, he drops out on that you're united to him and believe in him. When Jesus died on the cross... He took every sin you have ever committed and God placed it on his back, on his spirit. The Bible says that he, at that point, made atonement. That's an Old Testament word, a dead lamb. He made atonement for all your sins. When he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was because all Newt Larson's sins and yours were put on his back on the cross. Do you believe that? Tomorrow's sins, Wednesdays especially, were put on his back. He paid for them. He cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was because our sins were being punished. Don't you ever dare say, I guess I'm being punished for my sins. The punishment for sin is death, hell, separation from God. And when you honestly believe in him, not that he existed, that, that passes the demon test, but that when he died, all your sins, which you now confess, were put on him, that counts for you. Your sins are paid for. Today's, tomorrow's, next year. More than that, nobody goes to heaven with a zero. If that gets you from minus three million to zero, when you believe on Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, who he is and what he did, his righteousness now counts for you. Whoa. The perfect living righteousness of Jesus Christ covers you in God's eyes. Romans 4, 1, your faith is counted as righteousness, which is like saying salt is counted as pepper. Your faith in Jesus Christ to God registers you as righteous in Jesus Christ and covers you with his righteousness. Then we're called to live that way. Your sins totally judged and forgiven. Your righteousness not earned, but gifted. Is that you? That's what it means to believe in Jesus. That's what it means to trust him as your Savior and Lord. Affirm that in your head, in your heart today, right now. And James is saying, the word of God is able to save your souls by telling you that. 
In fact, he takes all that time in the Old Testament to kill lamb after lamb. Put your hand on the head of the lamb, son. Put your hand on the head of the lamb. Why, well, Dad? Put your hand on the head of the lamb. Show that you're, a, you're needing this. You're identifying. You're placing your sins on the lamb. And behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, Jesus. Now, if that's true in your life, when you read the word of God, you say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to get rid of that. Verse 21, 22. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Now, you hear the word of God like right now, hello. You hear the word of God when you read it, when Craig or someone else preaches, when somebody leads a study in a small group. Be, be ye hearers of the word, and do it. Don't be hearers only. Now he's going to give this great reason that every Christian should obey what you read. You got to read it, you got to study it, but it doesn't do any good unless you say, I'm going to do that. I'm going to study it, I'm going to believe it, I'm going to obey it. Here's the mirror test. Now, it'd be silly for me to ask, how many of you looked in the mirror this morning? I can tell you all did. You look great. Just that one guy over here. Now, you look in the mirror and you do something about it. I wrote to you on that little note. One time they asked Billy Graham at a, at a news conference, what's the last thing you do before you preach? They expected some gorgeous answer, spiritual. And he said, I comb my hair. <laughs> Ever since then, that's the last thing I do before I preach. Sorry, I can't do anything more with it. Nobody looks in the mirror and says, well, I don't care, well, unless something's wrong with them. But uh, you look in the mirror and you fix things. And he says, well, look at it. Verse 23, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. He looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was which is kind of funny the way he said it. He immediately forgets what he saw, but James is already jumping to the application. You read the Bible and you forget what kind of person you are and you need to fix that. If it says love your wife unselfishly, you gotta do that. <laughs> if it says to, to forgive someone, you don't, ha you don't have a choice. This is God's word. The maker of heaven and earth says love one another. Forgive one another. Cross racial lines. Don't be a problem to other people, but love them and, and give. So he talks about the mirror test. Do you do that? If you're a navigator or in discipleship group, you got to check something when you go to your accountability group. Yeah, I read the Bible. So what? Unless we do what it says. Don't look in the mirror and say... I don't care about that. Don't look in the Bible and say, I'm not going to change that. It's God's word. So this is James at his candid best. And when he does it, he talks about our responsibility. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, and you keep going, and the last one is self-control. Not the last one, but it's in there. I'm responsible for who I am. I'm responsible to look at the Bible and say, I'm going to change that by God's grace. And in this next verse, he tells us how this works, changing ourselves. Verse 24, he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. Now here he gives what I think is a great formula when you read the Bible. And you, I don't mean you remember all these, but look what they are. Who looks at himself in the mirror in the word of God and changes himself. 
we were all born into sin, even people in Traverse City, people at the bottom of Michigan. Nobody ever taught you to lie. You didn't have to go to kindergarten to learn to say your first, first four letter word, mine. We all were selfish from the beginning, especially my older brother. <laughs> now we must change ourselves by coming to Jesus Christ is the main way, changing ourselves and then doing what his word says. So you gotta read it. You gotta study it. You hear a sermon where somebody worked hard. I heard Craig's, I hear it almost every week from 1 Peter. He quoted Teddy Roosevelt who said that, that reading the Bible or knowing the Bible is worth, uh, I think, college education. Okay, I get that. But not unless you, not if you don't do it. Knowing the Bible is one thing. So we change ourselves by obeying what it says. God helps us, no question about that. He looks intently. There's plenty of times I've read the Bible a little bit and I'm done, quick. So I could say I read the Bible. Oh good, that's really good. No, you look intently, you listen. Even when a sermon is boring, at least the guy probably put hours and hours into that, you, you can grain form it and do what it says, what the scripture says. That's the point. You look intently, you listen. Yeah, that's God's word, I gotta do it. You forgive someone, not because you feel like it, but because God says, forgive. Okay, I'll do it. Is that you? If you follow Jesus Christ, he's gonna say to you through the word of God all the time and in your conscience spirit, Obey me. I think the whole world would turn to Christ if Christians had always obeyed this and modeled this. The third thing he gives in this list, which is just a whole bunch of phrases, that is, it's the perfect law, the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom. Now, some of you in high school live in a world uh, where people say, your age, I wanna be free, and it means to them usually drink all I can or, or be selfish or do sex before marriage. Come on. The Bible calls this, God's word, the perfect law of freedom. But I wanna ask, who's free? The person who walks in the truth as God created us and stays with a clean conscience and a steady spirit, or the person who does whatever he feels like doing, which is makes us animals. Who's free? The train engineer that stays on the tracks, or the one, if he could, who would say, I don't care about all these tracks, I'm gonna go wherever I want. Who's free? The person driving up 131 as I came yesterday, who stays on the highway made for that purpose, or the one who says, I'm going through the woods. Who's free? The person who lives his life as he was made to live for the glory of God or the person who says, I'm in charge. I did it my way. It's the perfect law of liberty. Do you believe that? The real free person is the one who gives his life to Christ and says, I honor his truth. I know there's places in here I don't understand or you don't understand. One, one great uh, person of quips said, it's not the parts of the Bible I don't understand that bother me, it's the part I do understand and don't do. It's the freeing way to live. And he perseveres in it. He keeps going. In, our, in my 26 years pastoring the chapel, somebody, every once in a while, somebody would run in, say they accept Christ, and not long after that, where are they? He perseveres. Uh, in a marathon magazine that I used to get, I never ran a marathon, but it ran some short races, and marathoners were asked, what keeps you going at 26 miles, 300 some yards? And there are three answers in the survey of hundreds of marathoners. Number one, water. 
What keeps you going? Water. Two, the encouragement of others. You can do it. One time in a 10K race, I turned to the guy next to me and said, tell me I can do it. He said, you can do it. I said, you're just saying that. We, we made it to the end, though. The encouragement of people. Come on. We do that at church. You do that in your small group. Charlie, you can do that. Keep going. Water, the encouragement of others, and the third thing in the marathon survey, I know there's a finish line. I know there's an end. There's a day coming when Christ returns, wherever, or when you die, wherever, whenever, there's a finish line. Martin Luther was famous for saying, you only have two days, today and that day the day you stand in front of Christ. Nobody knows if we have Monday this week or Tuesday. So the runners, it's good. Water, you have the word of God. You have the spirit of God. Drink. Blessed is a man who plants his life beside the river, Psalm 1. He bears fruit. He shows the love of God. She does. Be like a tree planted by the waters that bears fruit in his season. Doesn't ever wither because he obeys. This. That's water. Encourage others. Way to go. Thank you for your love. Encourage your family every day. Come on. And at church in groups. And the third thing is know that there's a finish. You can make it to the end. Run with endurance. Will you do that? That's what the word says. Perfect law of liberty perseveres in it. And then he says, not forgetful. Uh, what did you hear today in the sermon? Uh, what did you read in the Bible? Oh, I don't know. Stay with it. Not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works. This person will be blessed in what he does. If we do these things, and the last word blessed is a church word to some people, like blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are, no, it's happy, joyful, living a meaningful life. If I allow the word of God and God's spirit within me, Christ in me, the hope of glory, to change my life as I live. Will you keep doing that? Or will you start? If you haven't yet, trusting Christ and then allowing his word to change your life. We're all running this race in life. And, uh, you don't have to run fast. You don't have to be anybody else. Just be faithful. Read the Bible and do what it says. And it's clear. And then keep going, no matter who you are. Is that what you want? Isn't that what you really want? Don't you think it would be just exactly what Christ wants for you if you're in Christ to keep going? Your sins paid for, your righteousness granted. Now live with gratitude and show it. In the last paragraph here, he says, I, I know how, I, I, I can tell who's doing this. 26. If anyone who thinks he is religious or spiritual without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. The three tests are clear. Uh, one is the tongue test. Watch what you say. Listen to what you say. Everybody else does. God does. If he can make this huge universe, he can hear what everybody's saying at once. No problem. But... A spiritual person, a, a person with religion, it just means your faith shows. Watch what he says. She's careful with her tongue. You can do that. In coaching churches, I often I have said even to sitting with a board, why do you talk like this to each other? Why would you say that? I've said it to myself too. It's it's clearly a first test of our lives and of our faith. If somebody heard what you said for a whole day, the tongue test. There's more. He talks about in the next verse, if anyone thinks he is religious without controlling his tongue, 
His religion is useless and he deceives himself. Whoa. And then love and service. 27, pure and undefiled Christianity, religion, the showing of your faith, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this. Listen to this. It's not a great, huge statement. To look after orphans and widows in their distress. Huh? The two most neglected people in that day when James wrote in the Roman Greek world, orphans, they often threw them away. I'm serious. Widows, the woman's place was too low. Jesus changed that. But widows, he says, so please look after orphans and widows. Now, if you translated that today, kids, you'd add minorities, people who are underserved and very poor. Everybody in a room like this ought to have something in their finances and something in their time that we give to people that don't have as much as we have. The test is love and service. Include orphans and widows and unsaved and people in the world who have never heard the gospel of Christ. But also include the underserved and the underprivileged and some of them are minorities or people that are mistreated. If you want to show your love for Christ, you watch him go to the Samaritans. You watch him touch the lepers. You watch him care about the people nobody cared about at all, including sinners like you and me. So James is trying to get us to think, and he says, Pure religion and undefiled, I'll tell you what, you watch what you say and you care about orphans and widows and whoever the underprivileged are and the needy in your area and in your family and in your church. And then he adds the third one, personal purity. And to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, some of you grew up like I did where that was don't smoke or chew or date the girls that do or just don't do this and don't do that. The world in the Bible is defined as lust of the flesh, what you want to do, that's sexual, but also just anger and just anything you feel like doing. Lust of the eyes, this is how John describes the world, lust of the eyes, Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride. You keep, I keep myself, you keep yourself. We can only take care of ourselves in those areas. If you watch what you say, you're really honoring the word of God in your life, you'll watch what you say, you'll care about needs, and you'll watch your heart. So the mirror of the word of God, you've just looked in it. I think if we all did that, more of this world of unbelievers would say, I want that. There's a great scene in an old movie about Jesus. It was just called Jesus, where he's calling Matthew, one of the disciples, but in the picture, he's calling him to follow him. Matthew has already heard him teach and seen him heal and knows what it's about. He's a tax collector. He's a cheat. <laughs> and Jesus, it's done well in the film. Jesus looks at Matthew after some other things and says, follow me. And then he turns around and starts walking. The film is, is at this point very dramatic. Jesus doesn't turn around and say, Matthew, I need a tax collector. I need somebody to write one of the Gospels. Come on, will you follow me? He doesn't plead with you today and say, are you going to obey this? He says, follow me. And he starts walking. The camera comes in close to Matthew's face, and you can tell he's thinking. 
And he, of course, you know the result. He does follow Jesus. Here we go, one step at a time. And he says that to all of us, to me first, to all of us through this passage. Follow me. Read what I teach. Look at the way of life that I describe and then follow me. Will you do that? Keep doing that? Let's pray. Thank you, God, for truth. First, thank you for creating this world. How did you do it? The sun and the moon and babies and life. You are so far above us. Thank you for giving your word of truth to help us follow you. Please help me help everyone right now. As you pray, just just thank God in a quiet moment, not out loud, that he tells us how to live, to trust Christ first, please, to follow him and uh, obey the word. Will you do that? Ask for his help, not out loud, but just quietly in your heart. He can hear everyone. His help to watch what you say, to care about people, and to guard your heart. God, thank you. Thank you for the truth that guides our lives. As you pray, not out loud, but ask God, if you're not sure what it means to trust Christ and what the cross could mean in your life, and if you're ready, put your faith in him or say, God, help me know, help me ask somebody today how I can trust Christ and receive him. God, we pray that you'd help us read your word, study it, obey it, and be changed gradually every day. And we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the, the living word. Amen. Thank you again uh, for joining us online or in person today and uh, for Newt Larson for his challenge from the Word of God. I hope that you will take his words to heart. Let us be doers of the Word and not hearers only. Also want to mention to you, make sure that you sign up for our battle conference coming up October 1st. Uh, you can register online for that and be a part of it as we are equipped uh, to face the fiery darts of the evil one and stand strong in the Lord. Again, thank you for joining us uh, today at New Hope. Remember, you can also give online uh, and serve uh, and give back to the Lord a portion of what he's given you. God bless you, and thanks again for joining us today.